So we're excited to be here. We're we're working on our new book and we'll turn new it over book. to Eve. Hi everyone. So nice to see you. <clears throat> yeah, I've been really looking forward to this evening and moving into our second chapter of On the Path to Enlightenment. Just a uh, wonderful thing even to bring to mind that we are together on this journey. Um, I, I always forget to announce my own things. Um, thank you, Claudia, for reminding me. I'm doing a two-day online with one of our um, other teachers um, who has taught at the Dharma Collective before, Pawan. Um, and I actually have some free slots, so direct message me if you want to join. Um, I will tell you that I am joining on Sunday um, and she is leading Saturday. So if that changes anything for you. Is that, that's at Spirit Rock, right? I think that's online. That. Yeah. It's online through Spirit Rock. Online through Spirit Rock. Correct. Yeah. And we're, day one will be gratitude and day two will be awe. Um, what, what are the hours, uh, Eve? From 10 what? 10 to 4. 10 to 4, okay. Yeah. Yeah, which I, I feel is, it's a big commitment, um, but you can come and go, in my humble opinion. Um, and what else was I going to say? Yeah, I have a website in there. If you sign up there, I send out a newsletter once a month, uh, if I'm lucky. Um, and if you haven't and you want to know um, stuff that's going on, it's actually a Cultivating Emotional Balance um, newsletter. So it, every month we cover equanimity or anger or fear or joy and then share if we're doing teachings um, in, that, in that community. So, okay. <sighs> I feel like I've been preparing all week to, actually probably even longer to teach this class tonight because we covered last week the value of human existence. Such a beautiful, beautiful practice of starting to turn our mind towards the path and getting ourselves ready gradually, as Mechi Ricard instructs us to start receiving the teachings, integrating the teachings, no matter how many times we've done it, we always prepare with these preliminaries. And this week, chapter two is reflections on impermanence and death. Just a, just a little bit different than this precious human life. There's overlapping content there. When we re recognize the preciousness, kind of inevitably or invariably, we recognize that this preciousness is, is so fragile, in many ways so temporary, and uh, such, a, such a tender reflection, I find, this reflection on impermanence and death. Um, there's a number of, of quotes I wanna share with you, and I thought it would be worthwhile actually to share one or two before our practice as a good kind of segue in. Overall, a lot of the quotes and orientation of these reflections on impermanence and death is to motivate us to practice. And yet there's so many benefits of reflecting on impermanence and death beyond just motivation for practice, which of course is great, <laughs> is essential quality to be on the path. But what also is just so incredibly um, I'd say enriching about reflections on impermanence and death is its potential to tenderize our heart. And it's potential through that, whoa, do you guys see something change? That is cool. Uh, do I raise my hand? I'm like in a classroom now. <laughs> what happened? <laughs> what do you do? Oh. <laughs> I did it. I'm so sorry. It was a mistake. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I like it. You're messing it's with okay. our dimensions it's good. of space and time. That is wild. It's pretty cool. <laughs> wow. Okay, cool. Wow. I have a whole new outlook now. Um, I didn't even know that was possible. We should think about that. How can we make... I'd like us to be sitting in a circle. Okay. Anyway. Yeah. Um, this reflections on impermanence and death can really help us with tenderizing the heart. And that tenderness and that vulnerability, um, needless to say, it just can be so poignant and heavy. Really, really 
in some ways hard to hold. So before we go into kind of exploring, opening our tender heart to impermanence and death, we will do a Tonglen practice. A Tonglen is just one of, um, you know, such our versatile uh, tools in the tool belt and especially Tonglen for, for death and dying. So it's a practice that's commonly done for those who are um, struggling. <clears throat> I, um, I thought it might be worthwhile for us to, um, you know, have in mind, so you can take a couple of moments, someone who either has recently passed or someone who may soon pass. And just to remember that that is an experience each of us share together. And yet, of course, that we're going through on our own in many ways as a way to help us with this um, bringing forth and remembrance of impermanence and death. I will read just these two quotes. <clears throat> I really love this one by Padma Sambhava. As a river rushes to the sea, as the sun and moon glide across the mountains of the West, as days and nights, hours and moments flee, life flows away inexorably. And he has one other um, kind of one of these beautiful metaphors. And somebody's reminding us, you know, which we'll talk about more in the discussion that there are both coarse and subtle reminders of impermanence everywhere all the time. We can just look, if we, we'd have to truly try to close all of our sense doors to not catch on to that reality. So here's another Padma Sambhava quote. <clears throat> this life passes as quickly as autumn clouds. Family and friends are like passerby in a market. The demon of death approaches like twilight's shadows. What the future holds is like a translucent fish in a cloudy water. Life's experiences are like last night's dreams. The pleasure of the senses like an imaginary party. Meaningless activities are like waves lapping on the surface of the water. I think if this was the first quote I read by a Buddhist teacher, I'd be like, this is definitely not for me. <laughs> there is definitely like a heaviness and a like, don't forget, um, you know, don't engage with your friends. They are just like passerbys in the market and your life itself is like a dream. And yet, you know, I know because, uh, having gotten to learn about and, and read Padma Sambhava, these are, these are instructions to really help tenderize our hearts and open our hearts to this reality. Because even though, as I mentioned, literally everything around us is designed to remind us of impermanence, we forget. We forget every single day. And that's why this practice, you know, really across um, all the Buddhist lineages of Marana Sati, just this keeping awareness of death at all times, it's considered to be just one of the most fundamental aspects of how we can continue to, to deepen and grow on the path. So we will, with that prelude, go ahead. Oh, I realize my bell is in the other room. So give me one moment. And as we get started, if there is someone who comes to mind who you'd like to do this Tonglen practice for. I also invite you to share their name in the chat as a way for us to be connected. Maybe it's not recent for us, but maybe we can have that sense of taking in this reality. Each of us is connected to impermanence directly.
Thank you for weaving this web together, that which really deeply connects us. This shared experience of impermanence and loss as a way to begin our practice. <clears throat> so find a posture that is comfortable. Begin by settling into this precious human body. And connecting slowly and gently to whatever can be experienced as tactile sensations in the body. In this first part of settling into our practice, we really, as much as possible, keep inviting our attention and awareness into the body, into the body, into the body. For many of us, <clears throat> this can feel like a process of releasing or letting go. Maybe even as though our attention and awareness are dropping from the surface, into the deeper levels of being. We're not a head and eyes looking down at our body. As we settle into the sensations of the body, we experience the body from the inside out. Feel the body supported from the ground beneath you and let that be further invitation to release. When we feel supported, we can let go. Notice whatever quality of stillness you can find in the body.
And we settle our speech, eating as much as possible, turning down the volume, turning down even the impulse to communicate, to narrate our experience, of course, to be distracted in thoughts. Instead, notice whatever quality or quantity of silence is available. Focusing on the sensations of breath can help us in that settling of our speech. So maintaining an awareness still of sensation through the body. While inviting this more specific focus on the breath. Maybe it's easy to notice the breath as the belly rises and falls. Or maybe the breath is easier to notice for you at the apertures of the nostrils or the rise and fall of your chest. From this preliminary creation of a sense of stillness through the body, some more quiet or silence through the speech, we invite the mind too to settle in openness. This mind that is open lucid and loving. Not needing to generate that love, simply reflecting that most basic capacity. Connecting with the mind as a mind that is loving. Connecting with the speech, which communication that is loving. And connecting with the body as a body of love. Maybe this immediately resonates for you and you have a sense of warmth and expansion. Or maybe being a body, speech and mind of love feels abstract or uncertain. 
It is love that brought you here tonight to practice in community. And we can trace love back through our very existence. So this doesn't have to be <clears throat> conceptual and abstract. As we reveal this natural experience of love within us, as well as being the recipients of love. as we invite bodhicitta, our awakened heart of love, we do so from this greater grounding of love all around us. We can feel or imagine that this love, this intrinsic capacity of care could be seen as though it were a golden orb hovering right in front of the chest line. This dazzling orb includes all the love we have ever received, all the love we have ever extended, and all the love that is yet to come. It's okay if it's hard to visualize or see. We can just know or feel the potential of imagining all this love in one place. This is the love that transforms our sorrows. Not by denying them, but by understanding them. Inviting growth. Inviting change. Before we move into the Tonglen practice, taking a couple more moments here to really fortify and strengthen this felt experience of your own radiant capacity of love. Maintaining some awareness of this radiant or right in front of the chest center. As we begin to invite this Tonglen practice 
for someone who has recently passed or someone who is on their way. The Tongan practice is the ultimate act of the courageous heart, a willingness to open to difficulties, a willingness to take that difficulty and transform it to our heart. Finding and feeling the uprightness and strength of our spine, the radiance and warmth at our heart, softness in the belly. We bring forth this cherished beloved being. And consider some of the challenges they may have or may have had moving towards the end passing on out of this body. And we imagine their struggles specifically around dying. Maybe it was pain, maybe it was resistance, maybe both. Maybe it was just not wanting to leave quite yet. And without spending too much time getting pulled into the story, imagine you could pour out the worries of this beloved being into a swirling cloud of black smoke hovering in front of the belly button line. In this process, inviting courageously to transform and take on some of that struggle and suffering. It's okay if the heart feels tender or weepy. It's okay if it feels distant and far. Just remember the upright spine, the soft belly, the radiant heart. Couple more moments here visualizing this little dense cloud of dark smoke containing this offering, this receiving of struggle and difficulty. And with the heartfelt aspiration to be of service, to alleviate suffering, with our next breaths, we draw in that dark smoke into that clear light in front of the heart. And we exhale this wish of compassion. May you be free. May you know ease. May you be safe. Continuing on the rhythm of your own breath, inhaling in this dark smoke, seeing it evaporate just like clouds in front of the bright sun and extending out a wish of compassion. May you be free, may you be safe.
feel or imagine just the wholesome goodness of directly connecting to this desire to care and transform the struggle of this beloved being. Couple more breaths here. Really noticing this process of inviting, transforming, extending. Releasing thoughts, memories, images, and aspirations. Give yourself a moment here to simply rest in this experience of compassion while inviting in some spacious awareness. See if you can still feel that radiance at the heart center. That intrinsic capacity of love and being loved. Which also allows us to lose and experience loss. Taking a moment here to see if we could take a little bit of our own love. Noticing if there's residue of loss and sadness. Maybe in the face or chest or belly. And taking a moment to recognize that, of course, there is the struggle and suffering of this beloved being as they left this world. And there is <clears throat> our own struggle and suffering being without them. Strong heart, radiant heart, strong back, radiant heart. Soft belly. Invite the loss or grief that feels as though it wants transforming again into a dark, swirling cloud of smoke in front of the belly button line. There's nothing wrong with our sorrow or grief. And yet we can still practice for ourselves this transformation, this heartfelt aspiration to be free. So letting this sorrow and grief pool in that dark, cloud of smoke swirling in front of the belly button line. And with our next breath, 
We inhale and draw in those tendrils of smoke to the radiant light just in front of our heart. And tr transform and extend out through the exhale. May I be safe. May I be free. Inhale, drawing in. Exhale, extending this compassionate wish right back to oneself. And then we expand the aperture, recognizing how many are just like us, experiencing loss, desiring to be free. And with our next inhales, we inhale for all beings experiencing loss. Exhale, may we all be free. May we all feel safe. And continuing with this expansive heart, drawing in these dark tendrils and transforming them at that radiant light of the heart. One or two more breaths here. Letting all the tendrils dissipate. Leaning back, still with the radiant heart but releasing thoughts and memories and images, inviting in that spacious awareness. If it feels comfortable, you could even slightly open your eyes, inviting in the spacious awareness of the room around you. In the night sky beyond the walls, Letting the love and tenderness just mix with space. Thank you for your practice.
Any reflections or questions on that practice of giving ourselves some time to do Tonglen as a way to kick off Should probably stay on this chapter all year. Yes. I'll say something. Hi, everybody. Oh, what I liked about this meditation was um, what I it was really great. You know, previously I'm a little bit averse to visualizing um, breathing in dark smoke, but I felt like this time I, there was like a preheating element that we sort of generated some heat first. And I felt like safe. Oh, this is cool. I have enough heat. I've generated enough warmth in my heart. The black smoke's not going to bother me. It's just a visualization. And then I, I, I was able to actually visualize the light in front of my heart. And I was like, oh, this is cool. So it's kind of like a new thing. I haven't experienced that before. So I, I maybe lost my fear of this black smoke thing. Because it's like doing it from a cold start. I, I really wouldn't want to be doing that. So I don't know. I, I felt like that was good. And, uh, and I visualize, you know, the uh, loved one was my dear friend uh, that died and he had a ruptured aneurysm, a ruptured, you know, so he just died. It, but I know, you know some of the details of uh, it was a really dear friend, you know, and that uh, ruptured aorta, ruptured aorta. Had, and you're just you're gone. You're dead. It just just like that. Uh, but it was it was really a fearful for him at the end. Mm. But yeah, I know just thanks for the meditation. Thanks for everybody being here. Thank you, Nick. Yeah, beautiful um, insight there. Indeed, you know, it's it's a part of Tonglen that sometimes gets skipped. And it's often called flashing on bodhicitta, which is sometimes interpreted as, as emptiness, which I think is great. But I, I agree with you, getting the engine started and priming the pump, I find to be really helpful. Um, it's like you're building that inner resource. So yeah, not only is it not scary, I, I think, uh, I, I don't know what everybody's experience was, but it also can help not get like, so kind of collapsed into the grief of it because you're, you're buoyant a bit as well. It could be, I mean, very, very strong to do this practice. Like it's the ultimate, right? We're doing Tonglen for people who are struggling or difficulty, but their fear of dying, like that's about as core as it gets. So um, yeah, strengthening beforehand, um, I think can really help. So, so happy to hear that. Yeah, thank you. Mace Pamela. Yeah, I was just gonna comment also about the preliminary set up i really appreciated that um i i uh, was originally taught tonglen with the preliminary element that similar to what you led tonight and uh, it just changes the whole ball game for me and um i was i found just joy arising as as that came into this into the um, form for us tonight so thank you for that thank you Jenny Dahl. And to continue on with what Pamela was saying, that there's like this hope in peace. Hmm. Thank you. Any other thoughts, Claudia? I, I just, um, when you said something about trying to, I guess, send good vibes to people, I, I, I'm particularly thinking about my sister-in-law who's dying and uh, she's refused to have any more cancer treatment and she's under a lot of pain now and morphine and all that. But I was just thinking, I mean, sometimes I wonder like, why why don't you uh, request you know assisted uh, death uh, 
And, and but when you said something about resistance, you know, mm. I hadn't thought about that. And that is a form of suffering. So, yeah. So, I mean, I'm not sure that she's resisting when she has decided that she doesn't want any more treatment because of all the side effects. So in a way, I feel like, well, maybe she's accepting this mm. death, but the process is so painful for her mm. and for those around her. And it made me wonder whether she's resisting to some, some kind subconsciously, you know? So thank you for bringing that up because yeah, I mean, it is, it is a form of suffering and yeah. anyway, thank you. Thank you, yeah. Yeah, and, and I really appreciate everyone, you know, sharing um, their folks in, in the chat and just and naming them and um, not something we do a lot. And yet, of course, it's all around us, right? Um, so I, I want to dig in a little bit more um, and then ask you some more questions. Anyone else want to ask a question or share, reflect anything from that practice? Yes. Oh, you have to unmute. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I think it's a good exercise, a wonderful exercise, because we are going there. And especially not being afraid all the time or very afraid or it let, lets you live uh, a better life. It allows you to be to become wiser, hmm. and also to know what what's going to happen. It's going to happen to all of us, and uh, I think it's a wonderful exercise for me that I'm so afraid of dying. Hmm. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I agree. And you know, there's actually quite a lot of practices, um, as many of you know, around kind of this preparation for death and dying. And I think this, you know, this reflection is one of them, right, to just, it says to reflect on impermanence and death. And I'm going to read a, a passage here by Matthew. So again, Matthew Ricard is the, um, the monk and scholar who put together all of these um, uh, teachings from his favorite Tibetan masters. And he says, we can see the ephemeral nature of all things before us in two ways, gross impermanence, the changing seasons, the erosion of the mountains, the aging of the body, the fluctuations of our emotions and subtle impermanence which takes place in the smallest conceivable unit of time. At each infinitesimal instant, all that seems to exist in a sustainable way inexorably changes. It is because of this subtle impermanence that Buddhism compares the world to a dream or an illusion, an ungraspable constant flux. And I think it's interesting. I, I can really understand the gross or the coarse uh, impermanence that we can see all around us. That subtle impermanence, I think, is a, is a really interesting area of, of further excavation. At the kind of coarse or, or gross level, there's, of course, a very famous um, practice of sitting in the charnel grounds. And many of you are familiar that the charnel grounds are where people are taken instead of a cemetery, especially historically in India and other parts of the world. And this isn't a cemetery where you have, you know, dirt on top and a nice little, you know, headstone and flowers, plastic flowers in a vase. This is just where corpses go to rot with all their clothes on. And there's many different levels of this charnel grounds practice. You notice each stage and phase of the body decomposition. It actually, it serves two purposes. One, of course, is reminding yourself that, you know, yes, this is going to be you. There's no other way out of here. And to really get familiar with that tactile experience of death. 
It also, at the same time, can help you overcome desire. So there's one story from the time of the Buddha where there was a very beautiful woman who was attending the Sangha of the Buddha. And many of the monks struggled uh, with her presence. They had to look away and they were nervous and they were shy. And unfortunately, she died. She just, I can't remember what was the cause, but she died. And he ordered all the monks in that monastery to go watch her body decay so that they could really see desire to its end. <laughs> you think you want this thing, but do you see what it is? Like how much is your desire obscuring the reality? Um, so yeah, I think it's, I think the charnel gown practice for worse is all around us in our current climate catastrophe. We are living in the degradation of our world. And it is, you know, I think, <laughs> Um, as I was reflecting on, on this teaching, it, it's overwhelming if we don't have Tonglen and if we don't know like, that there is some learning that we can do with this. That actually, you know, as, as uh, my teacher Jennifer Wellwood would say, like these are the perfect ingredients for waking up. All this devastation in our world. Um, not only today, always, of course. I feel as though the Charnel ground, however, is definitely visiting us more frequently. Um, yeah, and you know the the course examples. Um, I was uh, on my way to Pacifica yesterday, uh, as was Jenny, and um, there was a forty five minute slowdown on Highway One. It was a huge car accident, and um, luckily, you know, last time I checked unbelievably, truly unbelievably, everyone was alive, uh, but an enormous truck trailer and three cars smashed in between it. Drive that, I drive that road a lot. And we, we, again, we just, we miss out and forget so often just how inconceivably small our little life is. How just in an instant, it could change. And so, again, that kind of meditation on impermanence at that level, at that course level, it's supposed to really fire us up about practice. And it's funny because it's not totally intuitive. It's like, wait, why am I going to practice more if you tell me I could die at any moment? What's that going to do? I think this is the uh, maybe not so um, often described benefit of meditation. It is perfect preparation for dying. It's actually the only instructions I know of, of how to die. It really tells us like what it is that we can start to familiarize ourselves for. How do we be with this fear? How do we be with this sorrow? How do we you know, face all of these challenges and difficulties? Because it's assured that they will face us when we're dying. And you know whether or not you believe in another uh, another passage after this life, the way that we die and preparing for that well is, is such a wonderful um, intention for us to hold. I mean, we also get the everyday benefits. It reduces stress, lowers your cholesterol, reduces your coronary heart disease. Meditation is great for all the mundane and uh, worldly pleasures, but you know, it also really helps us prepare for death. And I also think, you know, and I hope this is some of what we can experience in these Tonglen practices is it helps us prepare for the, the inevitable loss before death. That this a life is a life of loss, right? We, everything we love, we will lose, period. So that, that, that motivates me to, um, I, haven't, I haven't done this poem in a while. My teacher wrote a poem, um, many of you know, it is just so beautiful uh, on exactly this. And, and I feel that it's, yeah, it's very good medicine. So the poem is called, The Dakini Speaks. I'll ask Matthew if he can put it in the next edition here of the book. I think it would, it would help out to have, well, some more female voices for sure, uh, and some poetry. My friends, let's grow up. 
Let's stop pretending we don't know the deal here. Or if we truly haven't noticed, let's wake up and notice. Look, everything that can be lost will be lost. It's simple. How could we have missed it for so long? Let's grieve our losses fully like ripe human beings, but please let's not be so shocked by them. Let's not act so betrayed as though life had broken her secret promise to us. Impermanence is life's only promise to us. And she keeps it with ruthless impeccability. To a child, she seems cruel, but she is only wild and her compassion exquisitely precise, brilliantly penetrating, luminous with truth. She strips away the unreal to show us the real. This is the true ride. Let's give ourselves to it. Let's stop making deals for a safe passage. There isn't one anyway, and the cost is too high. We are not children anymore. The true human adult gives everything for what cannot be lost. Let's dance the wild dance of no hope. So many parts of this poem are so relevant. And the piece I really wanna highlight is, let's stop making deals for a safe passage. What is the life we live that is a life that avoids impermanence? That tries to pretend it isn't real, that forgets about it. She says, there isn't one, there is no safe passage and the cost is too high. Meaning the walls we put up around us to try to avoid loss are far worse than loss. Does that make, does that, do you believe that? <laughs> does that make intuitive sense? There's another big portion of this. Um, there's a, a, it's a quite a long story in this chapter, but I'll, I'll summarize it, which is there's a wonderful teacher, Patrul Rinpoche. Some of you may know him. He wrote the book in the words of my perfect teacher. It's kind of a, a quintessential text on Tibetan Buddhism. And it's a story about Patrul Rinpoche, who's this super accomplished teacher, very well known in his own lifetime. Then that he went to go see this yogi um, who spent most of his lifetime on retreat. And this was someone who didn't study much. They didn't have the books. And he just kind of had a sheepskin tunic pulled around himself. And Patrul Rinpoche sits and says, please share with me what you know, share with me your teachings. And he says, alas, it is difficult to bring together the freedoms and favorable conditions conducive to the realization of enlightenment. Do not waste the favorable conditions, freedoms that you have been granted. Do not let your life be spent in vain. And as he's saying it, he's crying. And he's crying because he feels it. He actually recognizes, not just conceptually, not just knowing, that we are dying, knowing that we have just this precious life and that so many people miss out on using it for practice. He really deeply feels the sorrow of it. And Patrul Rinpoche, you know, is so moved by these teachings, but his assistant is just so surprised. How amazing that this master who knows all the teachings and all the great, you know, um, books and translations that all he wants is just this basic experience that's transmitted with full heart. And I, I really love that idea that kind of part of our work with impermanence and death is not just keeping it in mind, right? Not having it as something we say as a prayer in the morning and reminding ourselves, or maybe at the end of the day, but really connecting it to our life and our lived experience so that it feels so deeply that it brings you to tears, but not that it prevents your practice. I think that's the hard one. Tears, at least for me, not a problem. Being able to integrate that into my practice is hard and feel overwhelming. Any questions or thoughts on this so far?
Anything coming up for folks? Okay, two hands. Yes, Laura, then Jenny. Yeah. Um, the thing about um, contemplating impermanence, I find, is that it can, like, I, I've thought about it with my dog, hmm. who I adore. Like, you know, she's like just the perfect dog, as far as, you know, just, and, you know, when I think about losing her, and I know I will, it just, it hurts, you know? And and yet, of course, I know it, it's like, it can sometimes get in the way of enjoying the moment of her because I have to accept that, that more likely than not, she will go before I do because that's just the way it is. So it's like these, it's it's weird. It can, it can break my heart to think about it too much too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you're pointing to that kind of fundamental tenderness. And, you know, I think there's, it's interesting because this word heartbreak, um, our heart, you know, uh, Chogyam Trimpa always says the, the spiritual warrior has a broken heart. There's actually no other way. You know, our broken heart is, is part of our spiritual warriorship. And I think it's, you know, it's interesting because this idea of, it's almost like we're looking into the abyss and looking at it and then we just kind of pull away um, without maybe experimenting like how 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 abysmal is that abyss do we truly fall in there and never get out it's something that it's you know takes i think quite a lot of um courage and faith but it's um yeah i mean i i do think what you know another incredible benefit in some ways of um reflecting on impermanence of death is this gratitude we get for what's there like the surf i had last night after seeing that accident was so much more precious because i was like holy that could have easily been me easily like i could have driven a couple hours earlier and you know it just and that so that ability to appreciate and cherish, but without the grasping. So there's no problem of like the sorrow, as long as we don't hold on too tightly, right? Just like there's no problem with the love, the same. But yeah, I, I mean, I totally resonate. And uh, there's a lot of, uh, you know, dog and cat moms and dads on this uh, call here. And it is, it is a, it is such a sweet love to experience. And then, yeah, such a poignancy to face. Um, Cause it's, it's fairly certain with our pets, right? Cause just cause of lifespan and- um, Yeah, it, it's just, it's hard to like, you know, yes, I enjoy her tremendously, but there are just those moments when I feel so sad that I can barely enjoy her cause I'm sad that I'm gonna lose her. And I haven't, I guess I have to learn to let go of the grasping, you know, that's yeah. probably the lesson there. Yeah. And then, I mean, and then this is an invitation, you know, an exploration. The sadness can be sweet. And so, you know, if we, if we consider like, what does this broken heart of the warrior show us? Very often that broken heart of the warrior, that's our uh, entryway into deep vulnerability. And vulnerability, Frank Ostaseski, oh, what an incredible teacher on grief and loss. You know, Frank says our vulnerability is a porousness. It's how we let others in. It's like opening up to that allows us to open up to everyone. God forbid, it sounds terrible. And yet, you know, there's that classic analogy that if you have like a little teacup full of water and you pour, you know, a tablespoon full of salt, and you try to drink it, oh, it's like impossible. But if you pour that same tablespoon of salt into a huge lake, freshwater lake, no problem. So it's just our ability to um, kind of widen our sphere of compassion and care somehow actually makes it easier to have that pain of loss. 
it's an abstract concept and idea. It's one we have to explore, but it's one I that really that like. makes I mean that that does make sense. And I've just been lately trying to practice like kind of a kind of radical empathy in every mm. situation I am where if, if somebody's annoying me or something, I suddenly think, well, what would it be like to be them right now? And um it's been helpful in getting me out of my own pain. Yeah. I'm thinking bigger and I'm noticing that that's having a really positive impact for me. Wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and these small, like in psychology, we call it reappraisals, you know, just slightly turning our mind towards difference, something different. Like all of the Lojong slogans are reappraisals, you know, just what's it like to be them? How many other people are struggling like I am, right? These small reappraisals that get us out of our little me. Wow. And, and you know, this death and loss is one of them for all of us who've experienced loss, timeless and boundless and groundless. We get all of those, right? It, it really does transform our experience of um, ourself and, and others and, and the world around us. Thank you. Jenny, are you still there? And then Claudia? Yes, but after all that just transpired, everything that I was thinking has so much changed. But absolutely, last night, driving by that accident, you see accidents and you have like, oh my God, their lives. Today sucked for them. But oh my God, and now my phone's ringing. <laughs> Let me turn that off. Um, but that one was different because it was so bad that as the setting, um, my mom, who doesn't take no for an answer, sorry. Um, I saw all the colors, like as I was driving by, my breath was taken away. My surf was so much different. My time being in the ocean, it was like every little tiny patch of blue that came out from the sky, I could see reflected in the water. But what you said about, I just want to have with that there is no safe passage mm. and wanting the full experience. I think about my dad who passed some time ago and that was so him. Mm. He just always wanted the full experience. And I'm sure in his dying, and going back to the meditation, when like just being with these people when they were dying and maybe what they were thinking, what they were feeling, the lives that they were then leaving. Like we know what it's like to get on a plane or train or drive away and say goodbye. And it's like that, but different. Right, because we don't know if we're ever going to come back. Mm. And there's about a million more things, but I'm done. Thank you. Thank you. Claudia, did you have your hand up? Yeah, I, I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more about how when you say that uh, our meditation is preparation for death, because sometimes I have felt like I'm truly in a blissful state. Mm. And I feel, I mean, I really, I have literally thought I'm ready to die. I mean, I could die right now. And not that I'm depressed or anything like that. It's just that it's such a, an incredibly an incredible sense of contentment and peace that I feel like I could go, you know, mm -hmm. but I'm, I'm curious about what you're saying, because I don't think that death could necessarily be that easy. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm so happy to hear about your practice being that blissful and that's wonderful. Uh, not all, not all the time. Of course, <laughs> so even even to get glimpses of that is so um, affirming, you know. For yeah, um, so yeah, so you know, there's a there's this kind of continuum between dreaming and dying and waking states that's talked about in um, in especially Tibetan Buddhism, um, 
where you look at, you know, often it said this dreamlike nature of reality. So any given day, what's happening to us is, you know, 25 to 75% projection, right? Like, why are they doing that? Why aren't they doing that? What's wrong with them? So we're creating this false view of what's happening, which makes it like a dream. In a dream, we don't know we're dreaming and it's happening to us. In our waking life, when we don't realize that we're projecting onto everything, it's like we're dreaming. And it's often said, and, and this is from, you know, these couple thousand years of reports from yogis who are dying or who um, have been able to somehow transmit this knowledge. And it's affirmed by folks like Frank and, and other people who work in hospice and end of life care is that when you're dying, your mind and body start to separate a bit. Not like you're going somewhere, but it's hard to know or feel a sense of, um, of clarity of what's happening. There, there's very rarely like, you know, I, I'm aware I'm dying right now. Okay, I need to let go. There's almost like a, a heightened level of dreamlike confusion. And it can be very scary because it's hard to parse out what's real and unreal. So if on our waking life, we can start to parse out those projections, like, wow, my mind is clouded by anxiety right now. Oh gosh, I'm really falling into a projection. And um, then we can bring that same level of discernment into dying. Interesting, right? Yeah, the Tibetan book of living and dying was another contender for our uh, well of being. And, and I really do think we, we should um, work with it. it. It actually doesn't have any of the, doesn't has very little of the bardo practices. So there are then these practices of how to guide your spirit through the next phases of um, reincarnation. Again, that requires a belief in reincarnation, which is great, but not as universal, I think, as to, to reach all people. Those, I mean, it's beautiful to read about it. It's a really interesting map of what could happen to us when we die. But the preparation practices I'm talking about that everybody could benefit from is developing that discernment, that ability to see our projections, our delusions and fantasies as projections, delusions and fantasies. And we can take that. I mean, this is why lucid dreaming is supposed to be such great preparation for dying. Though if you're like me, zero success ever. And I have vivid dreams almost every night. Um, so I'm like, well, I guess I'm just gonna, but I, I, I'm hoping that um, the work of getting more clarity in the mind, being able to understand um, thoughts and emotions and, you know, Franco Staseski, um, also um, Michael Smith, another great uh, Theravadan Dharma teacher, of course, Ram Das, a lot of these longtime practitioners who've had strokes and heart attacks often describe a lucidity during that experience that they attribute to their contemplative practice. So that the mind that they've been developing of being able to witness and observe, make space for what's happening actually does come. So that also seems pretty confirming to me that these practices can help us in the end stages of our life or in serious illness. I was on retreat with Michael Smith when he was having a stroke and we didn't know it. It was our 5 a.m. practice, it was very dark. And so, you know, sitting, meditation, whatever, 13 hours a day, this is hour one, so it's still dark in there. And he slumps over, I can just barely see it. I kind of heard it, so I opened my eyes. And I was like, wow, lying down practice, never seen him do that. Um, and then, you know, one of the other teachers next to him kind of helped him get up. And, you know, we later found out he'd had like a very massive stroke. As he is um, leaving the Dharma hall with assistance, he says, continue paying uh, attention to the breath moment by moment unceasingly, like literally continuing to teach the Dharma. He could barely say anything else. So I just just really beautiful to see those examples. He has made a really full recovery, by the way. Um, he and Michelle McDonald will be teaching an online retreat 
uh, after Thanksgiving. I've attended it. I attended it last year. I'll attend it this year. If you're interested in more Theravadan practice, which <laughs> neither Chandra and I teach, um, but it's really beautiful, just beautiful practices of mindfulness. Um, they teach it through Vipassana Hawaii. And I, if you're looking for a retreat um, that weekend, I really recommend it. They hold a beautiful container, the two of them. Um, so yeah, so I, I feel really encouraged. And I also think that another reason, um, Claudia, you're getting way more than you bargained for, that meditation is good preparation for dying is because we're gonna lose everything. And if our only orientation to this world is materialist, we are gonna be so disappointed if we don't have something else that sustains us, something that feels good other than you know, working out our bodies and having nice things and having a good job and good relationships. That's not good preparation for dying, that stuff's going. So in that way of really being able to kind of hold lightly um, the coming and going. Wonderful questions. Um, I want to read you maybe one or two more here. Thank you. Yeah. These are all interestingly quite similar um, in terms of this just reminding. Um, so the Buddha, Shakyamuni Buddha, like a shooting star, a mirage, a flame, an optical illusion, dew drops bubble in water, a dream, a lightning flash in a cloud. Thus consider all composite things. And the seventh Dalai Lama, uh, Kelsong Gyatso, when comes the time to carry the load of life through death's door. One can take neither relatives, friends, servants, nor possessions. Attached mind is instinctual mind, abandon attachment. Hmm. Um, and then Godrakpa Sonam Gyaltsen, body impermanent like spring mist, mind insubstantial like empty sky, thoughts unestablished like breezes in space, Think about these three points over and over. Hmm. And Milarepa, we will maybe do a little profile on at some point, such an interesting figure in Tibetan Buddhism. He says, fearing death, I went to the mountains through meditating on the uncertainty of when it will come. I conquered the immortal bastion of the unchanging. Now my fear of death is long gone. So he said, through meditating on uncertainty of when death will come, I conquered the immortal bastion of the, a bastion of the unchanging. So yeah, again, a lot of these are really focusing on these kind of coarse reminders. Um, but I, I really do think again that this kind of personal lived experience, both of being able to be with the sorrow and recognizing um, I am a, a fortunate person to have survived a near death experience. Um, I think I shared this at some point in our, our Sangha years ago. It turns out I am deathly allergic to fire ants. And I discovered this in, um, in Oaxaca in Mexico. Um, I was at a surf beach and just hanging out and noticed some ants on my feet, not a big deal, was walking out of the beach. And by the time I reached the top of the stairway that led out of this beach, I was like, wow, gosh, I don't know. I feel out of shape or something. How come I can't make it? And before I, I knew pretty much anything, um, I had passed out. My airway had pretty much all but closed in anaphylactic shock. And, you know, I survived only, I mean, I was with my friends, um, but it was also a stranger who came by and had a sense of what to do for me. Uh, I woke up in this pretty dirty uh, little clinic uh, where it's the only place they could take me. And, and fortunately, they, they figured out um, that I needed epinephrine. I think they just try everything. And when I woke up, 
I just had the most, I will never forget this. It's just the most sense of, of true preciousness of human life, but it wasn't conceptual. It felt like I had just, I had just entered into my body and it was the most wonderful place I could imagine being. Like it was so sweet. And there was that, that sense and kind of this real um, like vividness and brightness. I remember in my attention, my friends were terrified. I don't think it was as great of an experience for them, but it luckily uh, both are practitioners. And so we got to really kind of talk about that impermanence. I still had five more days in that town. Um, and now knowing I was deathly allergic to the ants, they were still everywhere. And so I got to do this incredible practice of fragility of human life. And just, again, this is always true. If, if you drive a car or walk on the street, that death could literally be anywhere. But to have that like intimate, visible recency, um, I got into this kind of beautiful um, exchange with the ants. I would talk to them, gracias, hormiga, <laughs> no hormiga, just trying to say thank you, no thank you, not today. Um, and do, you know, and just kind of be with that. And so when I was reading uh, on this chapter of how we can take, in some ways, our life experiences, both of um, impermanence and death, but yeah, also finding a way to um, feel the preciousness too. So really wrapping both of those chapters together. Um, and it just feels very meaningful to share this um, with you all. I mean, there's I just it's such an incredibly um, important part of our practice and, and hard to do alone, I think. I think we have to do this with each other. It really brings forth a a confidence and safety and willingness to, to be with this. So let's take a couple more moments to come back into meditation. Eve, I just want to say mm. that I'm very, very grateful to whoever saved your life. <laughs> and and uh, very obviously it is for a reason. You have a purpose. Mm. And as far as I'm concerned, I mean, I love you. I love you as my teacher and I have learned so much from you. I thank you, thank you, thank you. And I'm glad you're with us. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> thank you for saying that. So yeah, let's take a moment and reconnect to the body and sensations in the body. Noticing sensations, especially around the face and the chest and the belly. And connecting to this precious human body. And just a sense of true appreciation and gratitude for this day we got to live. And consider if some of our time here together, reflecting on impermanence and death, and practicing for our loved ones, for ourselves and for others. Really saturating this practice, this shared time together with the intention that everything we do could be of benefit to the greatest number of beings. That this practice could really help us and strengthen us in supporting those who are facing the end and supporting our own facing of mortality. And may any benefits of this time together and reflections be in service of all beings.
knowing safety, knowing peace, and experiencing freedom. Thank you all for your practice. Thank you, Eve. Thank you, Eve. Thank you, Thank you Eve. everybody. Buddy. Thank you.